session with the open mic and everybody can talk a bit to just create this nice feeling of social interaction in these uh, difficult times of uh, COVID-19 and this. I'm sorry, yeah. you're not sharing your screen right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing the screen. Sorry, sorry. Uh, let's share it. Oh, I thought I was sharing it. Oh, here we go. Oh. All right. Uh, you see it now? Yes. 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 Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so here we are. Uh, so, um, yeah, the EHG is a professional non-for-profit association and under its umbrella we have this local chapter established and um, uh, they also support us uh, with different uh, services and the platforms and we also uh, co collaborate with different uh, other local chapters or, or other divisions in geoscience and uh, engineering and uh, there are different upcoming events or, uh, but let's, let's for, the, for the sake of today, rush a bit over it because uh, we have two speakers today. And um, so there's an upcoming event on the 1st of February, 2022 with the DGMK, uh, digging deeper and getting ready for future subservice use. And uh, we hope you can all uh, join us there and yeah, uh, looking forward to see you there. It will be very interesting. Um, then that's our, our chapter. Currently, we consist of uh, six members. Uh, yeah, Elias, who talks also today, is one of them. Then we have Jan, me, Thomas, uh, Peter, and Bibke, and with all our different roles. And then uh, this is the way you can draw, uh, reach us. Uh, this is our email address. You can always just type an email there, or it's our LinkedIn page here. And uh, or you just take a picture or the barcode uh, scan here, then you can also get to our page. We also post about uh, job offers or events of our partners. So it's very uh, interactive, let's say, community. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we are hosting monthly presentations. Uh, we have also a little history already of, of uh, recent uh, presentation uh, of them you can see here the screenshots and yes and of course uh, we're always looking continuously forward to uh, more speakers to join us and uh, have interesting topics to uh, present it to the community and uh, yeah with that um, let's introduce uh, the topics i will now hand over to elias uh, and, and uh, then later Frank. so enjoy Thank you very much for this kind of introduction, Hannes. I will um, briefly introduce um, private docent Dr. Frank Strozik, who completed his um, diploma in geology at RWTH Aachen University in 2006. He then received his doctoral degree in 2009 at Marum Center for Marine and Environmental Sciences with a focus on submarine slope stability and seismicity in Bremen. In 2018, he habilitated in geosciences at RWTH Aachen University again, with a focus on evolution and structure of subsurface salt deposits, and has been working since then as a private lecturer. Lecturer, sorry. In 2019, he moved um, to the International Geothermal Center as a senior project manager, and since 2020, he's the head of transfer and strategy and senior project manager at Fraunhofer IEG. Thank you very much. I will now stop sharing my screen. Uh, so, uh, Elias, will you or will Frank first uh, share a screen? Um, I, would, I would share my screen. Yes. Thank you. All right. Perfect, Elias. Thank you very much for the introduction. You missed some of the stops I had, but that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually also work as a uh, transfer manager for Aachen University, and uh, this was mainly the reason why I got the job as head of transfer and strategy at Fraunhofer IG. But since I'm still a geologist, I'm totally into um, all these geothermal topics we're working on. So let me share my screen. Hope this works now. It's working, yes. Is that working? Yes, we have it. Okay, perfect. Uh, so my job today is in principle to uh, present uh, this relatively new Fraunhofer Institute, IEG, so uh, Institution for Energy Infrastructures and Geothermal Systems. And we are exactly two years old now, which means we are still somehow in the startup phase because every new Fraunhofer Institute uh, needs at least five years uh, to be really working and to be kicked off as a full institute in the end. 
And um, so today I will just give you a quite brief introduction on uh, who we are and what we are doing with a focus on our, uh, let's say, ge ge geoscience topics. And uh, then I would like also to present you some uh, of our projects, current projects we are working on the uh, in the, at the moment. But uh, I try to be as short as possible and quick as possible because uh, I want Elias to present uh, the results from uh, his project work. Um, so for those of you who are not really into that, Fraunhofer is uh, Europe's biggest society for application-oriented research. So at the moment, we are approximately 30,000 in staff, mostly located in Germany, but also abroad. And we are in total now 75 institutions and research units. And I guess we cover almost every aspect you can do in research, especially applied research. Um, what we always tell is that we play a central role in the overall innovation process, meaning that we are working close together with the industries and um, try to develop key technologies for the next generation of whatever you are working on. So I think we are quite somehow at the front of research when it uh, comes to the development of these new things. And this is something that also keeps us at I IEG at the moment quite busy. Um, IEG was in principle founded, as I said, two years ago, and we are setting up um, our uh, business units in, in total seven different locations in Germany. And as you can see, most of these locations and, and the offices we are setting up are somehow in, uh, located in the, in the, let's say, inner belt of Germany, which is uh, mostly related to our work somehow in this context of getting rid of coal-fired power plants in the next 10 to 15 years in Germany. So this is why we are located most in these areas here. And you can see that we are somehow closely attached and working together with a number of universities in these areas, which is a quite important aspect, especially when you want to kick off a new Fraunhofer Institute. Um, when it comes to research topics, we try to cluster these things somehow into these four main topics and one of our main topics is uh, integrated energy infrastructures we have a, a couple of working groups working on these topics which means we're working on transport and distribution networks for all kinds of matters um, district energy supply and especially also open district hub concepts and uh, we have a strongly growing uh, working group working on future uh, hydrogen infrastructures, especially grids and storage options. Um, going to the more geoscientific fields, uh, we are into exploration and exploitation of geo resources in general, with an at the moment strong focus on geothermal energy and systems, but also working in parallel on the next generation of geotechnologies to make this uh, happen in the end. Um, Another thing would be the extraction and storage of energy raw materials and indeed uh, CO2 capture and utilization, which is actually a field that is uh, quite a political issue and a little bit sensitive in Germany, but we are working on that. Um, the third field most, mostly revolves around thermodynamic converters. Um, so we are quite focused on high temperature heat pumps um, because there's a close link to district heating grids and indeed geothermal energy. But in the end also uh, on cold grids and uh, overall heating cooling sources systems and storage options. So one uh, quite important topic for all these activities is indeed also monitoring and controlling regulation and automation of the systems. This is something that is somehow implemented in most of our projects. And uh, we have a quite strong and growing group on the distributed intelligent digitally networked subsystems that uh, are always part of these systems. Um, a little bit out of scope here is the large scale demonstrators and laboratories, but this is something we are setting up in the moment and we're quite optimistic that we can demonstrate most of the things, technologies and ideas we have in the next couple of years. So having a really good rollout of the things we are working on. So this is in principle the organization structure we have. Um, we are working in total in six research units and uh, in the end all of these research units will have at least four competence centers. Again I here highlighted those which are working more or less in the geoscientific fields. Um, 
You can see the geo resources with exploration simulation, raw materials, resource management, geothermal geology, and global geo resources, geotechnologies, and we are quite strong in innovative drilling technologies. And since we are planning a number of deeper wells, we also have our own, our own competence center for deep drilling and completion. We are doing the reservoir engineer, also geo risk and risk management. When it comes to storage and underground systems, we are dealing with materials uh, or the material and heat storage in principle. Uh, one really strongly growing field is post mining exploitation. Um, so the reuse or the future use of, of all the mining structures that were left by especially the coal mining and how to use them for the next generation of energy uh, sources. Then indeed deep geothermal energy and borehole systems and near surface geothermal energy. And this is indeed a really good running field at the moment. Um, this is a picture I really like. So this is the Geoscience for Future image from the Geological Society and Partners. And I somehow try to highlight um, the things we are covering at IG at the moment, or we are at least developing. And besides all these things like seismology, geohazard mitigation, and all the things you can uh, associate somehow with geothermal exploration production in the end, I think one very important aspect for us, especially in Germany, is science policy and uh, addressing all these uh, NGOs and so on. So I mean, um, parallel to the technologies and the development of the projects and the demonstrators, I mean, in the end, one really important thing for us is all the policies around that and, and uh, let's say the administrative part of that. That's quite important for us. So I think we can cover uh, quite a huge amount of uh, scientific topics at IEG. We, since we are still in the startup phase, these things will grow indeed in the future. And um, indeed, we have to be a little bit flexible when it comes to all the demands of the markets out there. And, uh, and we have to check and always have an eye on where to go with our topics in the end. Um, so let me now switch a little bit more towards the motivation why we are doing these things. And um, in the end, if you look on uh, a comparison of the energy demand we have at the moment, and this is uh, indeed for Germany again, and how to compare this with the current status of the idea of the transformation of the energy system, we see that there are some really critical issues we have to address. So on the left side, you can see the current uh, demand of energy in Germany. So we have 9,000 petajoules in total that are required. And as you can see, approximately or almost 60% of that is for heating and cooling somehow um, of buildings, uh, of industry processes, etc. And if you look on the right side, um, this was from a talk I heard, I think, approximately two years ago. This, this was the overall plan on the, on the transformation of the energy systems with a strong focus on renewable energy sources producing electricity in the end. And this electricity then should feed into all the other, um, let's say, uh, strains of energy production and con consumption. But this indeed has some critical issues and we have to address them, especially when we see that the heat is just a very small part in this diagram here. And we see that approximately or almost 60% of the energy we need are heat and cold. So this is a sentence I actually stole today from another talk or from, from uh, an advertisement of the talk uh, I listened to. And I think it's quite true. So heat is half the energy transition, as we can see, and geothermal energy is a suitable and climate-friendly heating technology that can replace or help replace in fossil fuels. And this is actually what we want to message and we stand for, and we try um, to address as many people as possible for this topic. Um, this is an image that again shows uh, the temperature ranges of energy demand demands and uh, the temperature ranges that geothermal energy in the sense we are talking about as well as heat storage options uh, can provide and i will just go th quickly through this because uh, if you would go into detail into this list you can see that almost every kind of uh, um, uh, uh, heat consumer here or even cold consumer is listed um, from the industry side from buildings everything and the required temperature ranges. And as we can see in principle, geothermal energy, uh, both heating and cooling you, can uh, you could produce on the subsurface can cover almost everything that is listed here. 
And in the end, if you have an industry that requires really high temperatures, way above 150 degrees, yeah, so that's when we also would, uh, in the end, use a, a high temperature heat pump system to, to raise the temperatures again. So for us, it looks like geothermal energy uh, could cover uh, approximately or almost everything that, um, that, that uh, is listed here and would be a really good solution for us in the future. So the heat demand uh, we have looked at in the end meets um, an, 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 an slow down and actually in phase out of the cold fired energy, pro uh, energy production. And this is really a big issue we now we have to tackle um, since um, especially in central Germany and uh, other parts in Europe, uh, coal-fired energy production is still one of the key resources for, for electricity and for heat. And um, in the end, if we look uh, here in the western part of Germany, as well as in the eastern part, um, this is, this is the, the big uh, player in the electricity production. And the waste heat produced in these power plants is actually also used for the district heating in these areas. So we need a really uh, quick and efficient uh, solution how to, to cover these demands in heat besides all the electricity. And this is why, uh, well, this is one of also the key reasons why the IAG was funded and um, kicked off. And this is one of the, the reasons why, especially in these regions, we are working and trying to set up our demonstrators. Um, but we have a big problem with what we are aiming at. And uh, actually, if we look at the state of exploration on deep geothermal, uh, deep geothermal energy in Germany, meaning uh, 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 data from the deeper subsurface, so deeper wells and seismic data, we are actually looking on regions that are really almost free of such data. So if we look on the right on the uh, existing map of heat capacities in the subsurface that can be used for geothermal energy production in Germany, we see that especially those areas where we have this data in northern Germany, in the uh, Oberrheingraben and in southernmost Germany, um, there we have quite a good idea. And we have a lot of, uh, of deeper wells from oil and gas exploration, etc., and also seismic data. But this data is in principle missing, missing exactly in those areas where it is uh, needed the most at the moment. So in front of us, uh, before we start with the geothermal energy and, and all these feasibility, feasibility studies and, and setting up power plants and things like that, we really need a lot of exploration of the deeper subsurface. Yeah. So how we want to tackle that and not really, so there's one project I want to show you and I've already shown that a couple of times, which is the Weisweiler um, um, project we are working on uh, that really tackles um, a deeper subsurface exploration program. But uh, before that, I want to show you some other examples of what we are working on at the moment. And we always see that, that there, there is a close connection of geoscientific working and engineering in the end. So one of these things is the Big Jacko project, which is an EU-funded project, an international project in uh, Europe, and this is mostly on CO2 storage and um, a process that is mostly based on what has been already done on Iceland, uh, where since 2014 these guys are pumping CO2 with the help of water into the subsurface and producing carbonate minerals by uh, crystallization of the CO2 in the subsurface. Quite really good working concept. And uh, so these guys have to do these things because they are producing a lot of CO2 with the uh, hot water steam they are producing. And um, in this project, what we want to do from IS, IG uh, side, and we do this with a demonstrator in Bochum, is we want to test if this also works in, in uh, areas where we have lower temperatures and quite different sediments or rocks in the subsurface. So um, what we want to do here is to set up, um, in principle, this installation here. We have an ejection well, we have an extraction well, and we will have a fluid reactor to enrich the circulating water with CO2. And we'll have a look on uh, the, the capacity or the, the feasibility of storing CO2 in the sediments we see here uh, below, in, below uh, the surface in Bochum. Um, another thing uh, is indeed hydrogen storage, and uh, one of our bigger projects is called H2 Sponge. 
where we are looking on the storage potential of geological rock formations in Germany and maybe later on also abroad when it comes to uh, the, the capacity of, of uh, uh, hydrogen storage. And this covers in principle three parts, which is the, uh, the uh, evaluation of potential locations um, where could we uh, store hydrogen in the subsurface, the properties of the subsurface, so the rocks in principle, the reservoirs that could be suitable for hydrogen storage, and the technologies that are required. I mean, all of you know that uh, hydrogen is some, somehow the smallest molecule we, molecule we can deal with. And if you want to store this in the subsurface, that's really a technical issue you have to solve. Um, besides that, working on the drilling technologies, um, we still have an issue with the uh, um, with the uh, geothermal concept or the concept of geothermal energy production um, with the uh, with in, in insufficient connectivities and permeabilities in the subsurface. So um, one of our projects here is the development of a new drilling tool that allows us, uh, it could be either for the production of heat from the subsurface or also for storage options um, to, to uh, to somehow drill in the subsurface once you have a deeper borehole. And I mean, side track drilling and horizontal drilling isn't really that issue today anymore because we have a, a lot of new tools and learnings from the oil and gas industry. But what we are missing is a small, flexible tool drilling through, through really hard rock. So um, the idea is, in principle, once you have your deeper borehole, your vertical borehole, um, this tool then allows us to drill horizontally into any direction into the surrounding rocks, at least a couple of hundred meters. And the idea is to test this in the first boreholes to get attached or connected to, uh, to very different fracture systems, for example, so that the inflow of hot water into the geothermal production well can be increased, just as an example. So this is an example of the drilling technologies we are working on. And last but not least, and this will take a couple of slides, is the Weisweiler project, so our deep geothermal energy project in the Rhineland. And the motivation here is on one hand that we want to get rid of the coal-fired power plants, and on the other hand that one of the most promising uh, geothermal reservoirs in Europe, these carbonates from the Carboniferous and the Devonian are, uh, can be reached there in relatively shallow depth. Um, this is an, an, an overview on the district heating here. So we can see that there is the power plant located in uh, the area of Weisweiler and it's operated by RWE. And uh, they are producing a lot of uh, waste heat in this power plant and uh, 85 megawatts of this waste heat is transferred to the city of Aachen and is feeding there the district heating grid. And we need a replacement for that. So this, this power plant will be shut down in 28. So we are just seven years uh, ahead of that. And uh, till then we need replacement for that. And if we don't want to have uh, gas power plants everywhere, which is not really a step forward in the, in the overall energy transformation system, then uh, we have to test geothermal energy in this, in this region. Um, this is an overview. This is the power plant location. You can see there also the lic open lignite mine in the and we are relatively close to Aachen and really close to the highway here. So the logistics are quite easy for us. Um, one of the principal concepts we want to follow here is uh, we first looked into the city of Aachen and in the city of Aachen, we have some, um, uh, we have some uh, geothermal springs uh, at the surface actually. So geothermal uh, water or hot waters with up to 70 degrees are here in springs close to the surface and can be produced. And we can see that these uh, waters are produced from carbonates that were uh, brought to the surface by thrust faulting. And a very similar structural concept is what we want to see or hope to see in the Weisweiler region. So um, that we can also find these circulating hot waters there and produce them for geothermal production. And this is actually the exploration area we are looking at uh, in principle east of Aachen. And these, this exploration field follows uh, one of the major structural elements in this region, which is a big syncline. And we hope that in this syncline, we will find back these waters in the end. 
So if this uh, first uh, draft of a subsurface model from the geological survey is more or less true, we can expect that we can uh, find in deeper drillings these carbonates there, and they can be even stacked because of the thrusting, and there's a good chance that at least one of these carbonate layers will produce hot water. Um, why, are, why do we think that these carbonates are really good for geothermal exploration? Because uh, in the outcrops around the Aachen region, um, we see that there's a lot, lot of karst in these structures. So we hope to find these karst structures also on the deeper subsurface. And indeed, because of the strong tectonic deformation, there should be a lot of uh, fracture networks. And also these could be good for producing the hot water. So the plan is to drill a first exploration well to get a better idea of the subsurface structure and to update the subsurface model. And the second phase, a deeper exploration well, which then could also be set up as a first production well. And the third well would then be a re-injection well if everything works out. Um, this is an image of the things we will do next spring or in spring 22. Um, uh, RWE uh, transferred a an, an relatively large area from, uh, from this uh, power plant region to Fraunhofer. And then we will set up there and drill uh, as planned a drill, drilling site and drill this 1,500 meters vertical well, which uh, firstly, as you can see in this image here, um, this profile uh, is for detecting the so-called kohlenkalk, so the carboniferous carbonates, and providing input data for the subsurface model. Um, it will then be set up as a borehole observatory. So since seismicity is really a critical issue in this region, we need a good monitoring on, on seismic activity. And in the end, we will also leave the carbonate section uncased because uh, there might be opportunities for future projects on, on tests on uh, subsurface heat storage and so on. Talking about the seismicity, this is a uh, parallel project we set up, and this will run at least for one year um, in a big uh, group with uh, partners here from universities. We set up a, like a network of monitoring seismology monitoring stations, and we have more than 40 stations in the field at the moment. This is not only for uh, an assessment and evaluation of the uh, uh, risk for seismic activity and seismic impacts, it is also for uh, to get a better idea on the correlation or the, the connection of seismic activity and certain faults in this area. So this is the overall time plan. In principle, next year we will drill the first well, then uh, in winter 22, 23, or maybe one year later, we will have a large 3D seismic survey. So seismic data is definitely something we need to get a better idea of the subsurface structure and then start in late 24, with the deeper exploration or even production wells. In parallel, we want to set up uh, a research power plant um, operated by Fraunhofer IAG um, so that we can, in the end, if, if we're lucky and we can produce a lot of hot water from the subsurface, directly feed this into the district heating grid. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope it didn't take too long. and. Um, yeah, I think if you have questions in the end, then just ask me, but I will now hand over to my colleague Elias. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting insights into Fraunhofer IEG. And um, now I will share my um, screen. Maybe I can do it right now. Okay. Um, can you see it in the full screen right now? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Perfect. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. All right. Then um, I will uh, talk briefly about um, the more um, students' view of the Fraunhofer IEG. Um, so the work I did together with the Fraunhofer IEG for the Fraunhofer IEG. And um, yeah, it was a heat demand map of Northwest Europe and its impact on supply areas and identification of potential production areas for deep geothermal energy. So it's in the line with um, the deep geothermal energy and um, uh, the georesources uh, part of the Fraunhofer IEG. So, and again, if you have any questions, please just um, ask them in the end of uh, my presentation for Frank and me, or just ask them in the chat. 
All right, then um, I will briefly show you my content. So why um, why should I choose the front of IEG as a student? Then about my work and um, yeah, what are heat demand maps? What are or what were the projects on European level? Then which data we received and the processing and then um, a bit about the results. And in the end, I will talk about my evaluation and limitations. So yeah, why should I, as a student, maybe here are some students <laughs> listening to and um, wondering if it's uh, worth it to, to do your master thesis or in the future, maybe bachelor thesis at Fraunhofer IEG. And I can tell you, yes, it's definitely worth it. You get, um, as Frank already um, pointed out, super interesting topics in not only in the geosciences, but also in, in other sciences. And Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you get paid for a master thesis as well. You are uh, equipped with high um, tech, high end tech equipment, and you have an excellent IT support for every question. So, home office is no issue here. And um, yeah, your colleagues are super friendly, and you have um, super motivated mentors and everything. Now, I will talk about um, my uh, master thesis, and it was um, for the DG rollout project. It is an in, um, um, European Union funded project to um, enroll the deep geothermal energy within the Interreg region, which you can see on the right hand side. And one part of this project was to deliver a map of the spatial distribution of the heat demand at the surface. And with this um, heat demand data, it should be uh, possible to identify, identify um, potential hotspot areas for heat production, production using deep geothermal energy. And in the end, with this um, data and other data, for example, ge geolog geological data, it will be possible to um, create an end user web application. So decision makers or the market could decide if it would make sense to place a um, deep geothermal power plant in a certain area. On the right hand side, yes, again, uh, as I already mentioned out, you can see the um, interreg region consisting of the whole of Ireland, United Kingdom, Belgium, um, Switzerland, Luxembourg, and the northern parts of France, the south, south, southwestern parts of Germany, and the Netherlands. Uh, first, I will briefly talk a bit about the, um, what are heat demand, or what is the heat demand. Um, well, we defined it as the temperature demand for space and water heating per year and area. And maybe you, you um, mentioned that I already saying we, well, I did the work together with, with my colleague, Ms. Eileen Herbst. So when I say I did this work accidentally, we did the work together. I already mean this, I, yeah. And um, well, we had or we received data which, um, was possible to divide or differentiate between residential, commercial, and industrial heat demand. However, we, we did not receive data for the industrial heat demand, but it, in theory, it would be possible if we had received anything. Well, I think you got my point. So we did not receive any industrial heat demand data due to privacy issues and um, everything. The unit for our heat demand map was in, or is in megawatt hours per hectare um, per year. And um, there are also other, other possible units like terajoule or N uh, per, per square kilometers or anything else related to um, energy per area. On the right hand side, you can see two pictures indicating um, possible web application uh, with, which shows a heat demand for a certain area. Um, they are different because, uh, not because, but um, you can see one is um, showing presenting the heat demand as a 100 times 100 square meter grid. And the other one is um, presenting the heat demand in, an, in different shape polygons. I will explain this in a few slides in more detail, but these are um, so just for you to get an um, idea how these heat demand maps works. And of course the color indicates um, how much heat demand is on inside a certain area. So, but before I will start about our heat demand map we developed for the DG rollout project, I will um, first re first re firstly refer to the other two big projects um, mapping the um, spatial distribution of heat demand in Europe. The first one is the so-called hot maps project, 
which used the heat demand map to develop an open source um, heating and cooling mapping and planning toolbox for the U28 plus at national and local level. And the second one is the Heat Roadmap Europe project, which developed um, with, uh, based on the heat demand map, um, a low carbon heating and cooling strategy for 14 different EU member states. So you may asking, okay, well, um, there are already two big projects projects covering the heat demand of the whole of Europe. Why should we uh, create a new heat demand map? Well, because they have one big issue. They just calculated their heat demand. So we thought, mm, yeah, they used the uniform approach for the, for the whole of Europe and calculated the heat demand. Uh, based on energy statistics, building statistics, etc. They never really used um, heat consumption data. So um, we thought, well, maybe we can ask the uh, European um, authorities for their heat demand maps um, and look at their methodologies. And yeah, maybe they used real heat consumption data. So yes, this is how we did it. Um, we asked each ent entity here in the uh, entire region for their heat demand um, application or heat demand data they uh, need to provide because of an of the EU energy di and efficiency directive. And um, yeah, then we looked at their methodology, or maybe we looked first at their methodology and saw how they um, developed their um, heat demand heat demand map. Um, this is indicated as the quality of the heat demand data um, and the color. Sorry, the color and indicates the quality of these data. And um, green indicates that we, uh, these heat demand data, were using billing data and orange um, that they did it similar to hot maps and heat roadmap Europe. So they um, just calculated the heat demand. Um, then you can see the patterns on each different region, um, which indicates the spatial presentation of the heat demand. And um, yeah, the, the pattern here, for example, in northern France indicates that it has the, or that the heat demand provided had a resolution of 100 times 100 square meter, whereas horizontal um, pattern indicates that the heat demand provided had um, a resolution of only um, Administration, administrative um, level, so or community level, for example. Um, yeah, so the gray areas, well, they did not provide any heat demand data because um, they were in an updating process of their heat atlas or heat data, or they never had um, heat demand data. So um, we used hot maps, heat demand data for, um, for our heat demand map to fulfill these um, these holes in the entire region. And yeah, the numbers are indicating which entity provided us with their heat demand data. Now, since we got the heat demand data, we were processing it with um, QGIS and Python, and QGIS, sorry, and Python. And um, yeah, um, as I already mentioned or try to point out that we have um, different types of heat demands uh, data we received on a different spatial resolution. And the best spatial resolution data was on 100 times 100 square meter, where we um, had these kind of input data. And we just had to um, overlay a different heat demand grid, or in, uh, not a different, and heat demand grid in our coordinate reference system. So this coordinate reference system of the provided heat demand data was usually in a local, for example, France at their, um, I don't know the, which exactly um, EPSG um, coordinate reference system they used, but they had a different one to our um, um, 30, 34 um, um, coordinate reference system. So we had to retransform and reproject it. And if we just have a look at this um, orange polygon, and then we see this um, below or, or above this polygon, there are four um, of our mass polygon um, um, mass polygons, and we um, calculated an area shared um, heat demand for each of these polygons. So this polygon just has a tiny amount of the 
polygon below it and therefore it appears green reprocessed whereas um, th these ones are orange because they are it has a high heat demand and yeah this this was yeah just a re transformation this was um, kind of straightforward and um, yeah the second type we got were um, at the second type of heat demand data we got were um, heat demand using or pro provided with a within official within a statistical units spe especially built for the heat demand maps you can imagine um, they built it for example that they had an, an old core of a center or a village and they thought yeah um, these buildings are all the same and should have all the same um, heat demand data so we sum it up or calculate or um, agglomerated for one um, polygon and say yeah this is like there are 10 buildings having this this amount of um, heat demand and then we just use the shape of it to provide maybe um, more privacy for the for the people living inside this area but we um, transform um, trans sorry um, yeah we process it these status in a kind of similar way and receive or got um, yeah a similar pattern back Sorry, um, I will <laughs> now talk a bit about um, the, in my in my my opinion, the most interesting type of a heat demand we received. It was the um, official statistical units. Um, so we have um, local administrative units, for example, community on community level, uh, that the heat demand so the heat demand was provided on um, summed up on community level. And then we thought, okay, how can we increase the spatial resolution from community level, which is usually, I don't know, well, tens of kilometers in width and length, um, in um, up to a scale of 100 meters. And then we thought, yeah, we can use the spatial distribution of heat demand from the hot maps project, because they have already a highly sophisticated approach to um, receive all these, these or to, to get in, um, not, not in touch, but in account, to take in account these, um, the, the, the distribution of heat. And then we um, had the heat, uh, the hot maps heat demand data for each community and summed it up for each community. Then we um, um, divided the provided heat demand data by the hot maps data, by the summed up hot maps data, and got a scaling factor. And then we use this scaling factor to increase the um, um, the the um, the original hot maps data, and yeah, we, so we scale the hot maps data using and the, the spatial distribution of um, hot maps data um, using more recent or more um, more realistic heat demand data. And the last type of heat demand uh, we received were Im um, heat demand as an image data. We had to write an um, image um, processing script, and yeah, we, we did not receive any heat demand data at all. It was the gas demand data, and we had to uh, transform it into a heat demand. Then, so in the end, this leads to uh, three different heat demand maps. Um, the first one showing the heat demand of the residential sector, the second one the commercial sector, and yeah, the third one, yeah, the total heat demand. Um, it is not super surprising that we have um, that the, the con conurbations like London, Paris, Brussels and the Rhine Ruhr area are uh, standing out because yeah they have a high population density and therefore a high heat demand. To take in account that we um, received heat demand data and um, that there were already two big projects like Hotmaps and Heat Roadmap Europe, we thought, okay, now we have developed the three maps and one, uh, everything in as a 100 times 100 square meter raster. Um, why should we not divide, um, subtract, subtract every um, raster value from EG um, Hotmaps or from the DG? Sorry, why should we not um, subtract from each raster we um, created the value from, for example, the um, hot maps data? So we uh, build the difference between the GG rollout heat demand map and the hot maps data. And here you can see them. Sorry, I, that I maybe um, confused you a bit. And here you can see the difference for residential heat demand for between DG rollout and hot maps, and here for 
um, DG rollout and heat drop map Europe. Interestingly to see is um, yeah, there are some um, some regions which have uh, which indicate or which are more bluish, sorry bluish and more reddish. And this shows that there is a more positive difference or a more negative difference. Interestingly enough is that, um, for example, for France, uh, you can see that the rural areas are occurring bluish and the more populated areas occurring reddish. So yeah, this is just for you. Um, here you can see the commercial heat demand and or the different maps for the commercial heat demand and for total heat demand. So um, these were the heat demand maps we uh, developed together with Eileen Herbst and me. And then we thought, yeah, uh, we should maybe do something um, for our own. And then, um, yeah. I think this this should be uh, done then. <laughs> yeah, or how can we process the heat map, or how can we use the heat map data we we um, heat map maps we created? So um, Ms. Herbst said she um, wants to do an identification of potential production areas for deep geothermal energy in North Rhine-Westphalia, and I did an impact on supply areas and identification of potential production areas for deep geothermal energy. And the more interesting part is uh, the image here uh, on the, the right hand side. And here you can see uh, the heat map, map for the DG rollout um, uh, on, on the base map of Oak Street map. And you can see that there are some areas which need an environmental impact assessment. And this is the work done by Ms. Eileen Herbst. She stated out which areas are. Um, would require um, um, an environmental impact assessment, for example, and which areas are more suitable for the deep geothermal energy, also based on the deep geology, but um, I did not display it here yet. My work was uh, based on the placement of the deep geothermal power plant and the heat transfer point. And um, yeah, then you could say, yeah, okay, you have, uh, a certain amount of heat to transfer to a city, how could it look like, or how could a district heating network look like? And um, yeah, then it will calculate and supply area based on the highest heat demand. And I think if I talk about this, this will be a talk by its own. And I will just short it now and show you the results I did on, um, yeah, show you results because they are more, um, more self-explaining. So yeah, so I, uh, first of all, we created a heat demand map of Northwest Europe, as I already showed you. Then um, we, um, then Eileen Herbst did a protected area, uh, did a map showing the protected areas and uh, um, of, of North, of North Rhine-Westphalia. And um, in green, you can see the top of the Denensian strata, which is maybe suitable for deep geothermal energy. And um, on the right hand side, you can see my work I did for the front of IG um, showing a qualitative district heating network based on these supply areas I tried to explain you in short uh, in the previous slide. So um, were there some issues? Yes, there were some issues. For example, of course, we did not include any industrial heat demand. Um, we had to deal with partially old or missing data. The majority is calculated. Um, yeah, the majority of the heat demand we received were calculated still. And um, some of the heat demand data should be updated um, or some of the heat demand atlases should be updated in the near future. So we were not able to get these data either. And yeah, there were large data sets we had to handle with um, in the gigabytes um, area, um, in the yeah, in, in gigabytes of data we had to deal with. And then the outlook is, um, yeah, we want to publish our results in, um, in 2022. And um, yeah, there's, a, of course, the development of the decision makers tool for the deep geothermal power plants for the deep, deep, for the DG role or projects, excuse me, please. So yes, and of course, there's also a conclusion. Yeah, um, we developed a map showing the residential and commercial heat demand in Northwest Europe with um, consumption data provided by local entities. Um, then we 
our conclusion is um, to the uh, referring to the uh, heat demand difference maps this um, to predict a better heat demand it would make sense to use a different approaches for more rural for rural areas and more urban areas and um, areas with a high heat demand have great potential for deep geothermal energy and our um, next point is um, the next step of course to implement a web application and yeah that's it thank you very much for your attention and i will be more than happy to um hear your questions thank you hey great elias uh, great talk also frank uh, very nice talk um i already uh, see nice uh, some questions here in the chat um maybe we can do it like this i will just uh, read them and elias maybe you can then unmute also the person uh if there's a follow-up question shall we do it like this yes, and yes, uh, to sir. everyone if you have more questions just please uh, write it in the chat so uh, we know that you have a question or just say hello in the chat or whatever right so we know you want to talk or something um so first we have uh augustine he says uh, do you think geothermics have a good opportunity in europe in terms of job opportunity it is advisable to specialize in the field of geothermics if you desire to get a job after your studies in germany um yeah i think this, this question might address me um, in my opinion or what we've learned in, in the past years. And uh, we actually once did a project and tried to evaluate uh, how much workers are actually needed to, to uh, set up and operate on the long term uh, the field of geothermal energy. And we ended up with a quite decent number between 10 and 20 people are required for each megawatt of geothermal energy produced. So, and this includes all. This includes um, the, the, the scientific uh, institutions working with the first uh, steps into the uh, planning, exploration, and the research part, then the companies drilling the boreholes, the companies uh, providing the technology and, and uh, the equipment required for the surface and subsurface installations and everything revolving around that. So if we will have a rollout of geothermal energy in Europe, and we totally recommend that, uh, then there will be good job opportunities, uh, not only for scientists, but also for engineers and for companies and, and uh, yeah, providers of technology, everything. So from my point of view, uh, I, I mean, we are aggressively working on a rollout of geothermal energy. You have at least seen uh, the work of Elias showing that there is a big demand and that there is a good, let's say, overlap of potential areas or areas with the high potential for, for good production rates in geothermal energy and the, the epi, epi centers of, uh, of heat demand. Yeah, so that's a go from my side. I totally recommend going into this field. And, and to be honest, uh, at IEG, we, we are hiring a lot of people and uh, let's say 50% of them are coming from these, these are experts coming from the oil and gas industry and now try to somehow reorientate their focus more on geothermal energy and all the exploration and things that we have to do uh, compared to the strong decrease in oil and gas exploration and production in Europe. I hope this answers the question somehow. Uh, if you have a follow-up question, uh, I think the mic is open, right, uh, Elias? Yes, uh, I ask for the, um, yeah, to, to unmute yourself. Okay, so if there's no follow-up, okay. So if there's no follow-up question, then we can go to the next question by Sebastian or uh, um, to Frank. How many wells are needed to replace the waste heat of a coal power plant? It is early days, but how do economics look like? How many years can uh, such geothermal wells be operational before they deteriorate, if ever? Okay, so that's the big question, I have to say. Um, I can, at the moment, uh, so if, if, if I refer to our example from the things we are planning in Weisweiler, uh, I've shown you that at least for Aachen, or uh, only for Aachen, it is 85 megawatts of heat, and indeed with a, with a peak in the winter times. Um, but if we assume that we have a best case scenario of a an, uh, an geothermal doublet in Weisweiler, that produces uh, 30 megawatts, and this this would be really perfect, the perfect conditions, then you can do the math, then you at least need three of these systems to, to fully cover this 
this uh, heat production that is um, required. Wow. So in the end, um, this will be really uh, uh, cost intensive and time intensive. And um, yeah. So I'm not sure about the other power plants, but I mean, Weisweiler is one of the bigger ones. And uh, I think if you do the math and they can produce around uh, 100 to 150 megawatts of uh, waste heat, that also means you need, uh, I don't know, something between five to 10 uh, doublets to, um, to replace that if you want to cover everything with geothermal heat production. In the end, we think that's not the way they will go and with they i mean the energy uh, the energy companies the energy suppliers i think uh, geothermal energy will be tested here and there and maybe will be becoming a big thing here and there not everywhere because it doesn't work everywhere but where it works um i see that there's a good chance to cover i don't know 50 percent or so of the heat demand wow that's a lot 50 yeah. percent actually Oh. Yeah, I, I hope so. So this is what we are <laughs> aiming for. I'm I'm not sure if this will work out. So I mean, there's a lot of people who have to be involved and to uh, who really have to go with you and and your mission or vision on uh, what you want to do there. And I think the second part was on the uh, how long these things will operate, in principle. Yeah. Yeah. So this is another question that is not really easy to answer because uh, in the end i mean we know from a couple of installations th these things can run for 30 to 50 years without any issues but in other places because of circumstances in the subsurface you will have a cooling effect by time and uh, maybe at a certain point of time uh, you have to reduce the production or the production rate uh, which is quite a common effect you can see and indeed then uh, yeah, you will produce less heat from the subsurface or at a certain point of time, these things, things are not uh, economic enough anymore and could be shut down, which uh, I think that the math should be done before you set up the power plant, I guess. Okay, nice. Um, if you have a follow-up question, uh, Sebastian, you can just talk. I think Elias unmuted you. If not, I will read your next question to Elias. Yeah, let me... Thank you very much, Frank. Very, very interesting. And yeah, these are the uh, one billion dollar questions. Um, there was a middle question here. I'm not sure if uh, I slept uh, during the answer. Economics. Yeah. So, um, is this all affordable? Is this like uh, nice to have, uh, ac academic, as some people say, or is this something that could be commercially rolled out? Yeah, so the thing is, um, we are talking to a lot of energy providers, companies, cities, um, um, whatever. And it sounds like everybody wants that because it looks like you mean it is it is CO2 CO2 neutral and uh, you can produce a, a lot of energy or heat in the end 24 hours per day like this, um, but the investment is really high and the investment risk is really high. So uh, as long as you are out of the regions where we have a lot of subsurface data, really good and solid models, and we can really show like okay it. It, it totally works here. So I mean, setting up the next next installation in the Munich area is, is really like easy going because uh, eight of 10 projects work, work out there. But we are now working on the green field. So we have to do the first demonstrators and convince everybody that it can work. And, but there's still, I mean, when you look at the economics, it principally looks good if you just do the math, but uh, at, at the point where you just say you have to also calculate the risk when it comes to the investment. And I mean, drilling deep holes, two, three, four, five kilometers is still something super expensive. And um, yeah, so the, the companies we are talking to and working with, they are not at the point where they will do these investments. Yeah. So it's still, it's still a quite scientific and academic thing to do these things. And uh, we need the demonstrators here and there in Germany, in Europe, to show, okay, it can work somehow almost everywhere. I hope that's, so that's, that's the plan we have. Yeah. Super, I keep fingers crossed, it has <laughs> to work. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, hey, Sebastian, you also had a question to Elias SSC. Maybe as you're online already, maybe you can ask him yourself. Oh yeah, great, yeah. 
So two, two questions in a row is super. Uh, yeah, Elias, uh, super uh, project. And um, as we've seen, um, it is a combination of data uh, that really matters, whereas the heat demand, where is the geological opportunity to provide this heat. So uh, very valuable data. And I, I understand huge data involved and uh, a lot of smoothing, filtering and uh, massaging of the data. Um, now we also know that not every winter is the same, no? and uh, so some harsh winters require a lot of heating and uh, other more softer winters, warmer winters may uh, have um, less heat demand. So my question is, have you factored that in and uh, what is kind of the ratio? Is, is there like a, um, kind of a, a slashing of the heat demand by two uh, from a warm, uh, from the warmest winter to the coldest or what, what kind of uh, fluctuations do we expect? Well, this is actually a super interesting question. I uh, never thought about it twice. Um, yeah, there are actually hot maps and heat drop map Europe. They in, um, included heating degree heat days. I think that's an, um, I think that's an, um, um, median or um, um, middle wert. No. Average. Um, Average, thank you. <laughs> it's an average um, of um, of of a, pre of a certain period of, of heating, but um, since we just received heat demand data, we did not include this in our um, in our heat demand map um, in in more detail. And um, yeah, th this actually a valid point, um, which could explain the the differences between the heat demand data for some regions. And um, yeah, I, I never thought about this. And um, thank you for, for this question. And yeah, this would be um, yeah, interesting to maybe look um, if, if there's really a big um, difference between the um, heat demand data or if it's origin out or something like this. Yeah, no, super. Good luck with that. And um, you. maybe you can take the natural gas um, um, usage uh, that could be like a proxy to like winter harshness or so. Uh, so that's. Okay, well, thanks a lot and good luck with the publication. Thank you. Great, thanks uh, for the question. Then we have Aditya. I hope I don't butcher this name, uh, please. Uh, so maybe you can just, uh, yeah, Elias, if you unmute him, I guess you want to ask the question yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I actually have this question of uh, why do we, like, for example, there are a few technologies which uh, extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, pump it inside the ground and turn it into a stone or something that is like carb fix or something. Uh, why is this done? What is the profit of the company if this is done? Because there is no end product except a stone. Yes, like you're saving the earth, you're saving the climate, but uh, where is the company receiving profits from? Uh, well, this is my first question, so. That's a perfect question. Um... Uh, let's say it this way. I mean, in the end, you, you, you don't, as long as you're not really selling a product, indeed, you don't get money for that. But um, I mean, a, a company can get uh, money from other companies for, uh, let's say, uh, reducing the, the CO2 amount in the atmosphere. So, I mean, if, if you look on this concept of the CO2 certification uh, system that is uh, established right now, so if, if they, if they, pump the CO2 in the subsurface and store it there, another company that is producing and emitting CO2 can pay for that. I think that's the long-term goal. In the end, um, here, the, the principle and basic application is that the company like Carbfix, they attach to a, a energy producing company. So in this case, uh, they work together with the geothermal uh, production uh, plants in Iceland. And these guys actually produce CO2 and bring it to the uh, surface, um, just mixed in the, in the hot steam there. And they pay these guys for uh, not only, uh, so on one hand, they want to reduce the CO2 production by their own uh, with, with the shown project, but also pay the company for reducing the CO2 in the uh, surrounding areas from the atmosphere and get paid for that. But I have the feeling you're right in the end, uh, the economic uh, structure and organization behind that is not, uh, it's not at the end of, of how to bring the concept really, really to the market. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that is what he was. I was thinking about because uh, hydrogen storage is viable because uh, although hydrogen is not exactly a source of energy, it's a carrier of energy. You can store a lot of energy in hydrogen, but yeah. carbon dioxide is virtually useless. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, there will be, I think there will be next steps and projects where they test. I mean, on the one hand, we want to reduce CO2 and want to get rid of it. Rid of it. On the other hand, there are industries like the chemical industries who have a high demand in CO2 for their production. But what they need is pure CO2. Uh, so um, it has to be produced extra. So they, it's, it's really like, um, it's, it's not thinking in a, in a closed loop in, this, in, in a circle. And I think maybe the next step would be if we could uh, get the CO2 out of the atmosphere, atmosphere, clean it, get it in its purest form, and then sell it to the to the uh, chemical industry, something like this. I think this is something they are they are checking for at the moment. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, a second question is that for geothermal energy, like as much as I know, uh, the feed, like we pump in water so that uh, the heat heats up and turns the water into steam. If I'm not wrong, that's the basic fundamentals of geothermal energy, right? So uh, at the end of the day, there is water shortage in the world. So like water is a precious commodity in most of the country. So even though they have uh, potential for extracting the geothermal energy, they don't have water. So what do they do in this case? Good question. Yeah, I mean, in, in the end, the water you need for geothermal energy production and in the best case scenario you again have a closed loop and uh, uh, i mean uh, you just have to transfer the heat at, at surface uh, and this so all the water circuits that you need for the for the heat production and the distribution of the heat can be closed so it's not really like all of these uh, geothermal power plants produce a lot of heat uh, of, of steam and uh, bring it to the atmosphere so, I mean, uh, there are even uh, projects that try to deal with other uh, heat transport media like CO2, for example. So it doesn't have to be water. But in the end, if you circulate the water in the subsurface, and this could either be natural waters you're producing and pumping back in the loop, or you could even have a closed loop where you're circulating just uh, the, the same water again and again. And... Um, also at the surface, if you just feed it directly with a direct use system into the district heating grid, also this again, this is a closed water loop. So it's not like geothermal energy does not need in any case, um, like water as an endless source for the production. Absolutely not. Okay, thank you for correcting yeah. me. Yes. And, uh, and also already, um, uh, you have already told this, uh, geothermal energy itself, uh, if it comes up, it, pro it might provide a lot of jobs and everything. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, don't you think that if all the people are turning towards geothermal energy, it would cause a job stagnation or something like that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe in the end. Um... Yeah, so I think there is still a chance that geothermal energy in the end is just too cost intensive, too time demanding, and we don't see the big rollout of this technology that we want to see, at least in Europe or worldwide, however. I mean, there are some countries where this is working and, uh, and totally running, and uh, yeah, we can see what happens there, that more and more people are hired and working there, and I mean, at at a certain point in time, you have all these installations and you produce enough heat if, if you're lucky. Uh, but also in this case, there will also be progress. There will be more innovation. There will be more systems developed. So, I mean, if now everybody goes into geothermal energy and is working in this field, there is still a good, uh, not a good chance, but there is, there is a, a risk that we don't see the rollout that we expect. And that we have a little bit of a fallback and not everybody uh, can work in this field for the next 30 or 50 years or whatever. But, I, but at the moment, I see that actually we are missing a lot of people working in geothermal energy. So I think there's, there's still a lot of open space to fill with workers. And uh, I think there will be a lot of open space uh, in this field in the next decades. Absolutely. Thank you very much for yeah. patiently answer. Great. And then we have uh, one more question uh, of uh, Ibrahim. 
I'm not uh, entirely sure. I think uh, his question is uh, how this is communicated, right? Maybe there are problems with seismic measurements, this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. How is the public into this and what are the side effects? Around, what are potential problems with that? Maybe, uh, Elias, you can also unmute him if, if I maybe misread this question. Ah, I Ibrahim, <laughs> one of my students. <laughs> you hear me? Good to see you, yeah. Good to see you as well, yeah. Hi, Elias. Sorry, Mike. Mike. It's interrupting me for writing the, the correct way for the for the question. Okay. Yeah. I would like to know that how 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 the cooperation between the public and the uh, scientific societies in order to uh, build a bridge to understand more. Yeah. 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 Uh, very yeah. warm energy resources. Yeah. How, how how the landlords could like trust in you? We have like domestic uh, farms. How could we uh, allow you to? do such exploration. Yeah. So uh, in principle, what we see is that all these all these projects and things we do in, in, in on the topic of geothermal exploration and, and uh, in the end also production, that always needs a lot of, of public relation work and communication. So this these are really new field and exciting things we do. And most of the people out there, the public in general, doesn't really understand what we do there. It's even worse. It's not that they not only understand all the things we want to do and why they are necessary or a positive thing, like a seismic survey, a seismic exploration. It's more like there are, in, sadly for us, enough examples where something went wrong. And as it as, as it is always, people keep in mind when there was an accident or something uh, went wrong compared to all the positive examples. So this is indeed also the case for geothermal energy. I mean, we have uh, dozens of really good running uh, installations in Germany, but there are uh, it's a handful of things where, where we had critical issues and, and buildings were damaged and things like that, and we triggered earthquakes. And this is what people always refer to. So when you go out and talk to people about what you want to do, it's always it's not it's not like you 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 start at with with, with something blank and you can just explain and they accept or understand and ask questions. It's, they always start more critical, because I have heard there was an issue in there and there because uh, an earthquake and something like this. So this is why we take this quite serious and all the communication work and also for me, like a transfer manager, I'm involved in all these processes. We really need to show in a really good and, and clear way on what we want to do, why this is important, why we have full control on what we are doing. And I mean, a seismic survey, even if it's a big one and a 3D one. Um, and indeed, then you need to talk to the landlords and convince them, hey, we need now to do it in this direction and this is your land we know but this is totally required and uh, yeah so but but yeah this is something that is implemented with a with a big amount of work in all the projects we are doing and in in the end it's it often feels like you cannot do anything without showing it to the public so so you have to be really honest and 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 like yeah you have to show everything so then people it's but then it's more likely that people understand and trust you and and follow your ideas and say okay and i mean for the example of the city of aachen so the city of aachen is one of the examples the whole city stands behind the concept we want a an, an really strong and fast transformation of our energy consumption energy production for the city so and with such a positive vibe, everybody is indeed uh, open-minded to the things you are, you you explain them, and this but this can totally differ in in regions, especially if you go from northern Germany to southern Germany. You know people are quite different, and and here here and there it works quite well, and in other places you have to do a lot of talking and painting and convincing and things like that. Yeah. But that's actually the big fight. The big fight is not the money or talking to the companies and explaining the concepts. The big fight is the public. Yeah. <laughs> but thanks for the thanks for the question. Yeah. Thank you for the nice presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, then we have another question of uh, Justus, uh, Justus Jonas. Uh, yeah. Probably a question to Frank here. Uh, we have a lot of old onshore wells in northern Germany, which are nowadays mm -hmm. main water producers with a tiny bit of oil. Are you working on any project to reuse old oil fields wells, uh, maybe for district heating purposes, or uh, are you looking into it? 
is it feasible? It would re reduce the drilling capex, but on the other side, it may be challenging to do oil water separation, etc. Yeah. Yes. So this is one of the things that is that are developing strongly at the moment, and uh, we are working now in close cooperation with ExxonMobil, for example. And I mean, the reuse of the existing wells is indeed something that we should totally focus on. I mean, drill, since drilling is one of the most expensive parts of geothermal energy production, when you already have wells in place, the best thing is you can somehow reuse them. And we have some quite interesting examples, especially from, uh, from northern uh, Germany, where they even had to heat up the, the relatively shallow reservoir with a hot water steam to make it even possible to produce the oil from these reservoirs, which means that the companies uh, uh, spend or put a lot of energy and a lot of heat into the reservoirs and they want to get it back. And I mean, the concepts of uh, geothermal energy production for these uh, uh, almost abundant oil and gas fields is the first thing we want to tackle. And you can even, if it's hot enough, uh, produce electricity from these fields. Another thing that we can think about is um, indeed CO2 capture in the abundant reservoirs, but also we can think about gas storage, so especially hydrogen storage. But as explained, briefly explained in the one project, it is totally a question of the properties of the reservoir. So if, if uh, gas storage is in principle or hydrogen storage is, is feasible in these cases, yeah. Cool. Thanks, thanks, uh, Frank, um, yeah. for, for the uh, for the answers. By the way, I'm Thomas, not Justus Jonas. I'm not sure <laughs> so someone changed yeah, my true. name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, no, um, uh, thanks a lot. Um, be because I think that you know there was a lot of these drilling in southern Germany, even where they did geothermal drilling, and by accident they found some some oil. I think there is well, one is the Römerberg, and the other one was somewhere oh. close to Munich. So oh. I was just wondering whether you can do something. And there, there was another thing you mentioned in the beginning. Um, I'm, I'm coming originally from Bottrop, which has the, um, well, probably the latest coal mine, which was closed. And I yeah. used to do once an internship there back in probably 15 years ago, you know, and down there you had to cool down the temperatures to probably just to 40 degrees. Yeah. So do you know whether there are any plans to, to use these old kind of seams to, for heating purposes? Yeah. yeah, so this is one of the big topics we are following. And I, I actually just skipped it in this talk because I'm presenting it every other time I give okay. this talk. So the reuse of the old mining structures, uh, especially, especially in the Ruhr area uh, with, with the old hard, hard coal mining uh, structures, that's something where we are following two things. One would be a direct use for heat production. And there we are especially, uh, especially addressing, uh, let's say, the low temperature district heating. So if you can produce 40, 50, 60 degrees from the deeper mine parts, and you are, uh, especially when you're setting up new districts and you want to have these low temperature uh, networks, then you can use it as a direct source for these things. Because the, the, these, these former tunnels, the mining galleries, they are all filled with water and you could even uh, set up like a looping system, like for classic geothermal energy production. Um, for the shallower mines, um, we will use them for the production of cold. So in principle for the summer and for cooling down buildings, but also some of the industries we are addressing just need cold temperatures for their production. And I mean, even in the really hot summers, you can produce uh, water with temperatures between five and 12 degrees. So that's a cooling effect in any way. And the third thing we want to do is, uh, let's say also the shallower mines, but also those in, in the mid range uh, can be used as heat storage units. So again, we have this, these old uh, coal shafts, coal mining shafts and, and mining galleries filled with water. And the idea, and we are setting up the first demonstrator in Bochum, and we have also already done the first test run, is to heat up the water in the mining galleries uh, during summer with concentrated solar power, for, ex for example. So you have a an, an water of 18 degrees in this case, and we heated it up to 60 degrees. And then you have it stored for the winter. Then you can get it back to surface and use a high temperature heat up, bring it up to the 80 degrees or 100 degrees required for the district heating. And there you go. 
So I mean, the, this this old abundant uh, coal mining structures they are really really helpful now for when it comes to to energy storage to heat storage and and also to direct heat production yeah absolutely okay and this probably goes a bit back to what um, sebastian was asking because he was asking what happens if one winter might be cooler than others yeah. so you yeah. basically use let's say these things as a bit of a storage really facility to, to yeah. offset and um, storing over yeah. summertime and then yeah. reuse it over winter absolutely okay. and i mean i mean the concept of storing energy in any case that's always the thing you have to think in parallel to the transport or the production so when mm -hmm. I, i mean if we set up hundreds of geothermal energy producing places power plants these things will also produce in summer where mm -hmm. no one really needs the energy so then we always think, so is there a chance to store this energy for the winter? So when you have the peak demand. And same applies indeed for electricity, it applies for hydrogen, for everything. So storage is always a thing you have to think together with the, with the primary production. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for, for answering yeah. the question. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, if there's someone else who wants to ask a question, just uh, write it in the chat or, or yeah, un you can unmute yourself, by the way, now. Uh, you all have the rights to unmute yourself. Uh, and if there are not more questions, we can would, uh, stop then the recording and just go over to our just social part where everyone can just uh, speak and we can openly just, you know, just uh, in socially interact a little bit, you know, maybe have a beer or a tea or something.